by asking this question, what is God like? Uh, in your mind, what is he like? This is a really important question because the way that you answer it is going to determine an awful lot about your life. It's going to determine everything about your spiritual life. There are people who think all kinds of bad things about God and they don't have much of a spiritual life. If you think God is threatening or dangerous, you're not going to move toward him. What is he like? Is God good? Well, we all know the answer that we're supposed to give to that, right? Well, yes, God is good, and I know it says so in the Bible. God said about himself that he's good. But what do you actually feel and think about God? What is he like? What kind of person is he? Is he threatening? Is he welcoming? Is he enjoyable? Is he dangerous? What is he like? This is really important because... Nothing less than your life depends on the answer to that question. In the book that we're going to look at today, the, the verse that comes out of a book by a prophet named uh, Zephaniah, and Zephaniah's book is filled with darkness, really. It's a book that's loaded up with judgment. It's a short little thing, just three chapters long. And for two and a half of them, it's all bad news. It's scary stuff. Judgment and threat and danger. The people he's talking to have watched, they're, they're down in Judah, and they've watched the northern kingdom get dragged off into exile, and still they haven't changed very much. Even though they saw what God does to his rebellious people, they haven't really learned much of their lesson, and so this book is just filled with blistering judgment and rebuke. And there comes these warnings like this, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. And I'm going to suggest all that stuff in the top part is because of those last two lines. They don't draw near to God, and that's why they have all the oppression in Jerusalem. They don't listen to prophets when they come. Why not? Because their hearts aren't opened up to listen to prophets. They have closed, unrepentant hearts. And so they won't heed a voice that comes that says, draw near to God. But I suspect that part of it is that they don't want to draw near to God. Or maybe they think they already are. But they don't want to get close to Him. Not really. Because after all, is He safe? He is the only safe place. Listen to what else Zephaniah has to say. Seek the Lord, all you humble of this land who do His just commandments. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. And perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Because like I said, throughout the prophet, it's, he's talking about the day of the Lord, but it's not good news. When the day of the Lord comes, it's going to be filled with judgment and darkness and despair. But here's this, if you seek the Lord, maybe you'll be hidden. Maybe the danger will pass you by. I think for entirely too many people, Seeking the Lord is dangerous because like Adam and Eve, they just want to be hidden. And what do they want to hide from? Threat? Danger? Fear? No, they want to hide from God. They want to hide from God Himself, just like Adam and Eve did. Off in the shadows, staying away. And why? Well, what are the kind of things that we believe about God? What is He like? Tell me, when you're driving around and you see one of these, how do you respond? Yeah, you're all laughing because you know exactly what you do, right? Your foot goes right off the gas to the brake. That's true if you were going under the speed limit. You know, because it's so Pavlovian. You see the state trooper, and you're like, ah, oh, he was just danger, he's a threat. Why? Because he keeps the rules. And he's constantly watching. He's watching you. And if you're like me, even if you're trying to be... Good. Don't when you see when you run into that, do you feel a little guilty? You feel like maybe, just maybe, he's out to get you. <laughs> you ever run into a speed trap? Have you ever run into one of those? There's one in Arkansas. I can point out the city too if you want. I'm not gonna dog on the entire city, but I know they're there. I've seen them over and over again. I used to drive from Searcy, Arkansas to, to Memphis, Tennessee to get my education. And I can tell you that town which, which rhymes with Pearl, uh, but that's not its name. I'm not going to give away its, its Earl. Anyway, the, that town, 
has got a, I'm, I'm fairly certain they pay their cops and tickets, you know, and he's just sitting there waiting to get you. He can't wait to bust you. Know what God's like? You know, the one who keeps the rules and is always watching? Like the bad Santa Claus? Making his list, checking it twice? Watching for you to step one toe out so that he can hurt you? Why would anyone want to draw near to that? I tell you, North Carolina, the state troopers in North Carolina have got these. Uh, oh, hang on. These. Have you seen these? Can you see what that is? That's called a ghost car. Do you see how really faded out, really faded out, that says North Carolina State Trooper. You know, it glows a little bit at night, but it's hard, hard, hard to see. Why are they doing that? They're doing it so they can bust you. You know, so that they can, so that the, the take your foot off the gas to the brake thing is beaten. They're trying to defeat that. They want to see what you're really doing. Because that's what God's like. He wants to sneak up on you and catch you. Is this what he's like? Or maybe he's like this. The parent that you can never satisfy. I got all A's and one B. Yeah, but why do you have a B? I did my best. Yeah, but why wasn't it better? Why aren't you good? The parent you can never measure up to. The one who just wants to yell to you. Do you want to go near that? Look at that face. Anybody want to give that man a hug? Anybody? Is this what he's like? Or the really angry judge. Not, not Wapner or Judy. That's scary enough. But one who knows everything you ever did and has been watching and has this perfect record to measure you against and he's out to get you. Or maybe he's like that. Can't wait to, to kill you, except that souls don't die when they hang, so maybe you just get to suffer forever. Is that what he's like? What is this person like? And sometimes the Scriptures don't help us much. You know, because the kind of things that God says sound like scary stuff. I mean, it really does. In, in this, I told you this book's loaded with judgment oracles. You got this. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. He's filled with hugs, right? I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea and the rubble of the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Good grief, that's dangerous. That is a threat. And do you notice what he did here? The, the order of creation in, in Genesis is that you get birds and fish first, and then you get beasts, and then you get humans. And look at the, look at the order that's here. you got humans and then beasts and then birds and fish. God is saying, I'm going to undo creation on y'all. Well, who could stop that? He's warm and cuddly. Who, who wouldn't want to draw near to that, right? Why does he sound so dangerous? Or, or you have this, at that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish the men who are complacent, who say in their hearts, the Lord will do no good, nor will he do ill. Searching them out with lamps? There's a reason. And you know what? Those bad you've got, they're not all bad. You know, who is it that searches out with lamps? That's detectives, right? People who are trying to find the wrongdoer. And he's saying, look, you can't escape the long arm of the law of God. What is going on here? Is God a bad person? Well, here's the thing. Because we are broken, God is dangerous to us. And if we don't take that seriously, we will run into that danger. And there is a real truth here that we face eternal threat that we cannot escape. That we on our own cannot escape. Are you bigger than God? Are you stronger than He is? Can any of your schemes give you a good life or a good heart? That's what God is doing here. He's saying that this broken world will make broken men and women out of us. And indeed, it is dangerous to fall into the hands of God 
in that broken condition. We can't bear the weight of His glory as we are. He is beautiful and good, and we are not. And we are made of weak and fragile stuff. We die in the presence of the Lord. We can't see Him face to face. And that's not because, listen to this, it's not because He is bad, but because we are broken. We were made to bear the weight of His glory. We were made to bear His image, but we don't. And so there is all that dangerous all over the place. But let me ask, again, the question I start with, but what is God like? True enough that, that in our spiritual condition, you know, the, the danger and the threat of sin is a danger and a threat to us, but what is He like? The book of Zephaniah, full as it is of threat and danger and judgment and horror, also contains this beautiful verse because it wants to cast a true picture of God undistorted by sin before us. Not that God is distorted by sin, but our prism, our perspective, we look at Him and like Adam and Eve, we run from God because maybe He's a threat, maybe He's dangerous because we're loaded up with evil. But this is what He's like. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. That picture of God as an unaccepting father or of as a dangerous lawman or of an executioner or a judge, those pictures, they deal with something real, but the real thing is not God. It is our condition. God is like this. If I want to know who God is, I hear this God. Who, and by the way, just a couple of verses earlier, you sang a lot today about singing. It's because this is meant to inspire our song. In fact, just a couple of verses earlier, he, sings, he says, Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The city condemned a few verses earlier is now called to sing. Why do they sing? Because it is our God who sings. And note that. What is, it is God singing in this passage. What is going on here? He's showing you the true desire of His heart Towards you, And that is not to punish, not to destroy, but to have mercy and to reclaim and to restore, to remake you, to make you His and to sing over you with great joy. Every time I read that verse, uh, I was actually not terribly young the first time I was, a, I was an adult man the first time I ran into that. And I remember the wonder of, wait a minute, wait a minute, he's singing? And my heart was instantly drawn to one of my favorite and most passionate memories. One that stirs up emotion in me, and I'm going to try and do this without bawling my eyes out. <laughs> but of being carried around in a room with green carpet. 1970s eat green carpet. Horrible stuff. <laughs> a place with tight knit and I could have my little matchboxes on it and it had a pattern woven into it. So ugly. Uh, there's a big wooden coffee table in the middle of it, an octagon shaped thing with a big old uh, slate top on it. And also there's a stereo system. Uh, a record player. Kiddos, I'll, I'll tell you later what those are. But And my dad picking me up into his mighty hands strong arms holding me to his chest and in his deep baritone raspy voice singing this song are you familiar with the lyrics I don't know if I can read them or not uh, <laughs> it's by Peter Paul and Mary when day is done tell me why you're crying my son I know you're frightened like everyone Instantly, I am four. Immediately. And my dad is holding me 
and singing to me. And I heard the words, my son, and I didn't know, you know where, the, where the song came from, but I know where it came from in his heart. It came from him to me. This great, passionate love for me. This, this wonder of his dreams for me. His hopes for me. And looking at me saying, if you're afraid, I'll be here. I'll stand near to you. I'll protect you. And I will sing over you. Or tell me why you're smiling, my son. He loved this verse. You know, that, that my happiness made him so happy. My dad was a very troubled man. There was a lot of trouble in his heart. Which is why I think he particularly loved this song. Because he would sing, if you take my hand, my son, my son, all will be well when the day is done. It was this great love for me. And I couldn't know what it for, but it was me making him feel like everything was going to be okay. Because that's what love does. When love celebrates, when love voices, everything will be all right. And when it's all over and done, this was one of the big hopes of my poor man, father, my poor broken dad, was that it would be okay somehow, someday. And he would sing in the midst of his horror and pain and shame to his son that all will be well someday, somehow. And when I think about God singing, I'm transported to that, to the person who only my dad couldn't really mean it. You know? He could sing it and he could hope for it, but he couldn't promise it. In fact, he would sing that, that verse, will it help if I stay very near? I am here. But by the time I was nine, that wasn't true anymore. But when God sings, this is exactly what He's doing. He's saying all will be well, all will be well, and all manner of things will be well because I am here and I will stay very close to you. I am near to you to protect you from the scary thunder and the terrible pain. I am here to hold your hand. I am here to love you and rejoice over you. I am devoted to you. And whoever you are, this is your God. This is what He wants. It's why He's done it all. Why He created in the first place is so that He could have more people to love. And that devotion of a father who picks up his child and sings... That's your God. But then, why then does God so often sound so very scary? Throughout the book of Zephaniah, God is responding to something that threatens His child. Have you ever seen this movie? I can't recommend it. It's rated R, but I, I personally really loved it. But, uh, but it's... Uh, it's a movie about a. If you haven't seen Taken, um, I'm, I'm again. I'm not recommending you do. It's incredibly violent, very bloody movie. But what the movie is about is about a, a man who I think he works for the CIA or something, and he's in, he's a very dangerous operative, very dangerous. And his young daughter goes to Europe on a backpacking trip against his will. His divorced wife has kind of arranged all of that, and he's terrified for her. And off she goes and. and up into the dangerous places where, where the bad things can happen. And she calls home and is talking to Daddy right when the bad things happen, right when she's abducted. And he ends up in a conversation with her kidnappers. By the way, spoilers. <laughs> where he says this, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you want. If you're looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have any money. 
What we do have is a very particular set of skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. That's terrifying, isn't it? The dude on the other end of the line is dumb enough to say, good luck. And then the movie rolls forward from there. And like I said, it becomes unbelievably violent. Now, what is this in front of you, this gross, violent movie? Because I think that's actually fairly similar to your God in the book of Zephaniah. All of those threats in the book are to the evil that has abducted our souls. And God is saying, you have my child. And if you let them go, well, we can be done. But if you don't, I am coming. I am coming. Because our God in the creation story is a father bereft for a time of his son, of his child. And you are the child. You are the child in the hands of the kidnapper. You are the child in the hands of the human trafficker. And our God is the God saying, no, no, that will not stand. I mean, what, which of us who is a parent if we could do something about it, and our child were in that kind of danger, would not move heaven and earth to go get our kid. Wouldn't you do it? Does the cross not make sense? Your God looks at the evil that threatens you and says, I am a God mighty to save. And evil, I am coming. And, and child, don't worry. I am coming. And whatever it is that threatens you, I am strong enough. Whatever power is against you, I am enough. No matter what danger you face, I am strong enough and my love is enough and I am going to get to you and nothing will stop me. I have everything I need to come get you and I am coming. I am coming. I am coming. Now, this is an important distinction. This is where the, the analogy breaks down. When Liam Neeson's child is taken, he pours out unspeakable violence upon his enemies. When your God, when his child is in danger, he receives unspeakable violence to himself. He doesn't have to wipe out everybody. He can redeem everybody. He saves he rescues. So while Liam Neeson's truly ugly, our God's picture enters into ugliness to be truly beautiful. To save you for Himself. He stepped into the danger, whatever it is, because He feels that compassion, that wonder, that love of a father for a child. And when He sees you in danger and threatened, He says no. And He stands up and He charges into the danger. Even if the danger kills Him, He comes. And even if the danger kills him, it can't stop him. And that's why the rescued feel rescued. It's why the redeemed feel redeemed. He says, I will quiet, he will quiet you by his love. Why do you need to be quieted? Because the threat has been so real. The danger has been so omnipresent. Don't you feel, even now, the pull towards sin? Even though you're redeemed, don't you feel the longing for what you shouldn't have or the lack of control that you know that you should? That is the threat that you face. The danger is all over the place and God is saying, no, come to me. By my love, I will rescue, I will redeem, and I will quiet you. It is my love that will tell you that everything is going to be okay. And you can know it's all going to be alright when the day is done. I am here to save, to rescue. At the end of the movie, Taken, spoiler, he gets the girl. He rescues his daughter, and she sobs in his arms. That's the picture in Zephaniah. The picture of God holding his frightened, saved 
child saying, you are mine. You are safe and I will quiet you by my love. I've done everything I needed to do to get you. I chased you as far as I had to. I came into every dark place so I could save you. Nothing stopped me and now you were with me. And I have quieted you by my love. And He rejoices. He rejoices over us. The saved. The redeemed. The rescued. He rejoices with loud singing. The God victorious who finally has His child back, saved from the danger, from the threat, says, now, Let's sing. You at last are safe. You at last are beyond danger and beyond threat. And Christian, your God sings over you every day. You are in His arms. You are saved. You are safe. Your God loves you in a way that I can't begin to describe. And He rejoices over you with loud singing because you are God's victory song. And your redemption is His relief and His great joy. When a child is threatened, the parent feels horrible. But when the child is safe, it's time to sing. Our God has done everything for us. We are saved. We're safe. And our God is a singing God. How are you doing with this? Let me end with where I began. Who is God of ours? You see, when, when you believe that God is doing everything that He can to rescue you, and He's all about your salvation, you won't run from Him. You'll run toward Him. You'll want to be with Him. As long as you believe that God is at all dangerous, then you'll run away. When you know that your God is a God who has moved heaven and earth to rescue you, who wants to quiet you by His love, and wants to sing the victory song with you, to pick you up into His arms, hold you to His chest, and sing loudly about your salvation, then you want to run to him. Which direction are you going? Are you hiding in the shadows? Or are you running to God? Where are you? If you need to make a change in direction, today's a good day to do it. And if you need the help of the church to pray over you, we want to do that. It may be that you came into this place bearing weight that has nothing to do with what I've talked to you about today, but you need to get it off your chest and you want the the prayers of the saints to help you. If that's you, we want to pray for you. And if you're not a Christian, there's no better way of life than following Jesus Christ our Lord. Today's a good day to start. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, why don't you come right now? Always stay.